not you can do keto with type 2 diabetes. It, it, this is kind of a funny one because I get these questions a lot in my email. I got type 2 diabetes. There's no way I can do keto. And I'm like, you should do keto. So take it away. Thank you very much. All right, guys. I'm back again. I'm sorry about that, but they, they scheduled me for another talk. So you're going to have to endure me one more time. Now, this topic is actually much. No. <laughs> okay, okay. Here we go. This topic is actually probably, arguably, one of the most important topics that we're going to talk about on this cruise, okay? This is one of the most important topics you're going to hear about with reference to keto, okay? In the United States today, if you lined up every adult in the United States, more than half have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. What? Yeah. This is a medical disaster in the making. And that's the bad news. The good news is, is that keto is what's going to fix it. Okay? And there are a lot of healthcare uh, providers and officials out there that don't know that yet. But that's, that's my prediction. And that's why I started this journey was because I got tired, sick and tired, first of all, being sick and tired. And I fixed that. And then I got sick and tired of my poor patient suffering and having to pay $500 a month for their medication for type 2 diabetes and hoping I had a sample. And if I didn't, then they would just have to take a little bit of their medicine each day instead of the full dose because they couldn't afford that medicine because it was $500 a month, right? So the, the, the title is, can you do keto with type 2 diabetes? My response would be, how can you not do keto if you have type 2 diabetes, okay? The ketogenic way of eating is the answer and the solution for the type 2 diabetes epidemic in the United States, okay? And so when, when Nisha solace hyphen Berry got sick and tired of hearing me complain about these patients with type diabetes, they wouldn't this and that and the other, she said, why don't you make a YouTube video? And, and I was like, yeah, whatever, whatever. And so after about the 10th time she said that, I said, fine, you know what, I'll make a YouTube video, okay? And so I basically made it my mission to turn the tide of the pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes epidemic in the United States. That's my, that's what I, that's why I'm here today, okay? Is there are people who are going down this road of diabetes and pre-diabetes who are going to suffer unimaginable consequences, okay? You can't, you just can't imagine not having a foot. We can play mind games and try to imagine that. You can't imagine that. You can't imagine trying to lay in bed at night and your feet are burning and tingling so bad that you literally cannot sleep, right? Imagine that, that's torture. I mean, that would, that's something we would use in medieval times to get the truth out of somebody. And that's their life, that's their life. And, and you know what caused that? Some genetic thing, no. But some, some uh, unavoidable environmental, no, no, it was their damn food, their food. That's what caused that, okay? It was completely and totally preventable and nobody took the time to let them know or nobody did know in order to let them know and now they get to suffer for the rest of their life. They get to go to dialysis three days a week or they get to, to tap the cane and, and have a dog now because they can't see anymore. Those things are all preventable. You understand, in the United States, it is a multi-billion dollar industry to make very expensive medications to give to patients who don't need the medication. That's literally happening every day in the United States when it comes to type 2 diabetes. And we're giving them improper medications. We're giving them these exceedingly expensive insulins. And they don't need it. They don't need this, okay? So type 2 diabetes, let's talk about this. First of all, Type 1 and type 2. Everybody know the difference? Type 1, you don't make insulin. And you need insulin or you'll die. Type 2 diabetes, you still make plenty of insulin. Okay? You just eat so much glucose, so much sugar, so many carbs that your pancreas can't cope. Now, whether there is a genetic predisposition to this, I think there probably is. I think there's some there's there's genetics that make us insulin resistant. And and I think 50,000 years ago. That was probably a good thing. If you were very insulin resistant and very carb sensitive, 
because you could eat two acorns and a half a rat's tail and you would you would get all the nutrition out of there every calorie right you would store it as fat and you'd be the one that didn't starve to death but now with the McWinty kings on every corner <laughs> we don't that that's actually a curse to have that kind of genetics now and there's argument about whether there's a genetic part of this or not but I think there probably is but I think also ultimately it doesn't matter because if you fix your diet you're gonna fix your body okay so out of type 1 and type 2 type 1 really can't be helped type 2 is usually self-inflicted what what's the percentage what do you guys guess how many are type 1 versus type 2 if you're a provider don't say it type 2 is the highest you think what, what do you think it is 60 40 70 60 40 95 see this is the thing and I think this is propaganda because I don't think they really want you to know what percentage is self-inflicted diet-induced diabetes? 85 to 90 percent wow. of all diabetics are type 2. That's also where the big pharma makes all their money, is on that population with the very expensive medications you see advertised on television every day. Type 1s can't help. They, they just don't make insulin. They have to have insulin, right? But insulin, now, you guys may or may not know this, but the guy who in invented or, or came up with insulin gave the patent away. He didn't charge for it. Anybody know his name? Well, I, well I, you can Google that. That'll be good social media practice. You can look at it. Okay? So, but you know what's happening today is Big Pharma's not giving away nothing, are they? No, they're actually jacking up the prices. Insulin used to cost, like literally you could used to, you could get insulin free at the pharmacy. It was so cheap and so inexpensive because there's no patent on it because the guy gave away his patent trying to save the world. That's how doctors are supposed to behave. That's how doctors are supposed to behave, okay? But now they've come up with these new insulin where basically they tweak the molecule a little bit so you can get a patent on that new molecule. Now they can charge $600 a month. And if you don't like it, I guess you can suffer, right? So 90, 85, 90% 90 of all the diabetics in the United States are type two, okay? And over half of the US population adults are either pre-diabetic or diabetic. Does that not blow you guys away? Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 it's normal now to have disease. It's, it's more normal than to be healthy, okay? So the ketogenic way of eating, how is that going to help type 2 diabetes. Anybody in here fixed your diabetes with keto? Yeah? Just just two? Anybody else? What was your highest A1C? Um, 12. 12? Oh, oh that's terrible. Ooh. Everybody knows what A1C is? Does everybody, does anybody not know? Raise your hand because it's okay. So A1C is a test, which it's a blood test. And with that test, I can pretty much guesstimate what your blood sugar has been averaging over the last three months. And so when I check your blood sugar, that's just a spot reading of what it is right now. That didn't really help me any at all, actually, unless you're using it after a meal to see if that meal was okay or not, right? But when I check it, hemoglobin A1C, I can tell what your blood sugar has been doing for the last three months. So many adults go to the doctor once a year for their annual checkup, and the doc checks a basic metabolic panel, right? As part of the very limited lab work that your insurance will pay for. That's got a fasting blood sugar in it. Right, and that tells you right now what your blood sugar was. Did you know you can be a severe, uncontrolled type two diabetic? And if all your doctor checks is just the fasting insulin, it can be normal. And your doctor's like, well, you look good, I'll see you next year. And okay, now why do we care so much about diabetes? You know the terrible complications that come with diabetes. But here's what you may not know. When you have pre-diabetes, when your A1C is 5.6, to 6.4. Most doctors will say, well, that's a little high. Be a, exercise a little more and cut back on what you eat and I'll see you again in a year and see how it's doing, okay? Most doctors act like that's not a big deal. That is a huge deal, okay? There are two very large, very well done studies. One was done at my alma mater in Memphis, Tennessee with veterans. From the time you develop prediabetes to the time you're diagnosed, who, who, who knows how long that normally is in modern med American Ten medicine? Years. 10 to 15 years, okay? Now you're thinking, well, they're not diabetic, so it's no big deal, right? Well, these two big studies prove without doubt damage 
is being done when your A1C is 5.6, 5.7, 5.8. So if anyone in here is a pre-diabetic and you thought, well, okay, I'll, you know, it's no big deal. No, you're at every day that your A1C is above 5.6, 5.5, you're doing permanent damage to all the tiny arteries in your body that can't ever be taken back. That's why by the time you're diagnosed as a diabetic 10 years later, you're in trouble. You've already got severe kidney damage. You've got damage to the retina in the back of your eye. It's a big deal. Yes, ma'am. So she's had some cardiac issues and she, her doctor's telling her that they want her at a seven. Why did they, they say it's like her heart. Why did they say that? Well, it's her heart. It's her heart. I didn't mean to make you mad. There is no, <laughs> there is absolutely no logical medical reason for, for you, for a doctor to want her A1C to be at seven. That is malpractice. That is reprehensible. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, yeah. They, and, that's, and that used to be the American Diabetic Association's guy. Oh, we want it to be from six and a half to seven and a half. Because what they're scared to death of is low blood sugar. Because if your blood sugar drops too low, you can definitely die. But if you're a type two diabetic, the only thing that can make your blood sugar drop low is the medication that the doctor gave you. Wait, what? What? Wait a minute, what? So. If you just stopped all your diabetic medications, you would never have low blood sugar. Never would he go to 30 and you pass out and wreck the car. That would never happen. But when he gives you the, the $500 a month insulin, if you use too much accidentally, and it's impossible to guesstimate your dose. A lot of docs try to teach you how to, oh, this many carbs, okay, you're gonna take this. That's, that's all witch doctory. That never works, okay? So yeah, the ketogenic diet is absolutely what's gonna save you from severe, severe worsening heart failure, kidney failure, dementia, all those other things, keto's the answer, okay? When, so you started out with a 12. What was your A1C? 7.9. 7.9, which most doctors would say, oh, it's not too bad, okay, we'll see you next year, <laughs> right? So you, you know, you've done enough research to know you were having severe damage be done. And this damage can be done, it's done on the microscopic level. Okay, and so you'll know. You don't, right. you don't know there's a little damage done to your right retina today. You'll know that, right? You're able to see seven, you're like, well, that's okay, but you don't realize that you just lost 25 tiny arteries in your left kidney today. They're, they're gone, they'll never come back. You don't know because you can't feel it. You, you can't feel it until you wake up with a retinal hemorrhage and you're blind in your right eye, or you wake up and, and you feel terrible, you go to the doctor, you're in kidney failure, right? Or you wake up, your ankles are swollen, you can't breathe, you're in heart failure. Then you know it, but then it's too late. And so every one of you guys either is a pre-diabetic or a type two diabetic, or you have multiple friends and family members who are diabetic or pre-diabetic, right? Multiple, every one of you guys, there's not an exception in this room. And this is what it, when it comes down to, because I can promise you the American Diabetic Association, like I said yesterday, they're never gonna come out with, with like, you know what, we're, we were wrong about eating all those carbs, you need to stop that, you need to listen to, to Jimmy Moore and Dr. Barry and eat the keto. It's never gonna happen, right? So this is gonna have to come from you. You're gonna have to save your brother. You're gonna have to save your aunt. You're gonna have to save your mama. That's how this is gonna work. And that's how we're gonna literally turn the tide on type two diabetes and make it not a thing in the United States. And I won't stop until we get there, okay? So, questions about any of this and, and, and I don't care how basic your question is I want to answer every question because this is vitally important yes ma'am I started out 10 years ago and my A1C was 13 Ooh. and Ooh. of course you know they tried to put me on metafabs right I that whole nine yards right I ignored I was warned about kidney disease things like that um and just a couple of years ago I discovered a Facebook page for type 2 diabetics basically gave the keto diet mm -hmm. and we couldn't believe the difference after a week I dropped my meal time meds um, and then now I'm down to six to eight units of insulin yeah I guess my question to you is and of course same reason my doctor wants me to drop it one is metformin is still okay to take assuming I have damage right two would you recommend that I like bring it down two points, you know, each? Because now, about a week and a half ago, I stopped taking it. And you know, my morning 
range of 120. You mm -hmm. know? And what was your latest A1C? Well, the last one was 6.2. Okay. Before that, it was like 5.6. But I. So you strayed a little bit. I'm probably right, and yeah. I'm probably due maybe November. Uh -huh. you know, yeah. So. And do you know if your 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 pancreas still makes insulin? I assume so because I've dropped a man. Now, should she have to assume that? No. no. Should her doctor damn well better have checked that? Yes. Yeah. And and informed her. Yeah, you still make plenty of insulin, or no, you don't make insulin anymore. How can you manage a type two diabetic patient and and the, and not know if they if they still make insulin or not? Right? That's like trying to start your car with no gas in and not knowing yeah. if there's gas or not. I don't know. We'll just try and see. We'll see. I don't know. Is that something he should tell you? Uh, what do you think? Would you like to know that answer to that? Or should I have to ask? Or should you you ask? should not have to ask, but it sounds like you're going to have to ask. And so you're going to ask your doctor either for a fasting insulin test or a C-peptide. Oh, and C-peptide is actually the better one because you don't really have to be fasting for it to work. And if you take insulin, exogenous insulin, it won't affect your C-peptide level, okay? And C-peptide is a, is a uh, protein that comes with insulin, it's packaged with it. And so when insulin comes out to do its job, C-peptide floats around in your blood and we can measure that. And then I can know for a fact with one blood test that cost about $15 cash, if you are a t still a type two or if you've become a type one, because sometimes that happens. And so you need to know the answer to that. But she started with an A1C of 13, which means her blood sugar was averaging over 350 on a daily basis, right? And so she's got that down to, to 6.2, was better than that, straight a little bit. And your, your A1C is always gonna fluctuate, that's okay. But you wanna keep it as low as you possibly can. That's how you live, have a good health span and a good lifespan. Who else had a, yes ma'am. from 10.4 to 6.1. Yeah. It's a great move. You still got work to do, but that's very nice. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. But, um, my question is, I've been diagnosed with diabetes since 1994, and I've never taken insulin, but I have been diagnosed with insulin since 1994. And then I see ads on TV for some medicines that say, you know, even if you're on insulin, and even if your um, A1C is good, mm -hmm. you're still That's totally true. And that's, and so, and let me tell you this, and there are, uh, Dr. Jason Fung is a board certified kidney specialist, and he's got a ton of videos about this. They're right about that. And so if you, if you are diagnosed with type two, finally, when your doctor gets around to diagnosing you, right, then he's gonna put you on a bunch of medication, and that's gonna lower your blood sugar, lower, lower your A1C. But would you be surprised to know that it, it almost has no effect on your risk? for heart attack, for kidney kidney failure, for dementia. They, so type two diabetes is a, is a disease that you cause at the table, okay? And so it's a disease of too much sugar in your blood. And it's also a disease of too much insulin because when you are making, when you're eating all this, the carbs, it breaks down ultimately into sugar. If you eat a Twinkie, what's that break down into? Sure. Glucose and fructose, right? Okay, you got that? That's two different sugars. When you eat raw broccoli, what are the carbohydrates in that break down to? Sugar. Glucose and fructose. Wait, what? Yeah. All carbohydrates ultimately break down into sugars. There is no exception. And that's why all of the doctors in the ketogenic space can confidently stand up and say, there is no essential carbohydrate. There is no essential starch. There is no essential sugar. If you never ate another gram of carbohydrate for the rest of your life, you'd do just fine, okay? And so I'm not advocating a carnivore or a zero carb diet because it's, it's hard for some people, but if you are a type two diabetic and you're not under 5.6 as far as A1C goes, you need to cut your carbs. And you need to cut the stupid carbs first, there's no doubt, right? 
you need to cut the garbage, as Jimmy Moore says. <laughs> but then also, you gotta if you're if you go if you cut the garbage and you're more active, you do everything right, and you go back and your A one C is still above five point six, you need to cut the carbs more. And that might be cutting broccoli. That might be cutting kale. That might be cutting out almonds completely. I know. I know. Oh, no. I know. <laughs> yes. I just check an A1C and a C peptide on all adults if with any degree of obesity, any degree if their if their blood because you know as as a, uh, a lot of docs if your blood sugar a fasting blood sugar is 100 or 101 or 102 they're like no oh, that's probably fine and I can't tell you how many patients I've had come to me who have been type two for years undiagnosed and every single that once a year annual exam their blood sugar is 105 103 fasting. Then I check an A1C, it's 9.2, right? And so they've had all this damage done for all these years. And who's accountable for that? Who's to blame for that? Who's going to make that right? Can't make it right. It's too late, right? And so when you start to take a medicine that, that lowers that chronically high blood sugar from too many carbs without the proper diet, you do lower the blood sugar. You do lower the A1C but you keep the insulin level chronically high. And why do we eat keto? What does it do, Jimmy? Why are we doing that? To keep what low? Yeah. We want a low normal insulin. And inflammation. Right? And so you're getting all this high insulin doses constantly because half the medications that you take by mouth for type two, they work by raising the amount of insulin your pancreas produces, okay? <laughs> then the other half is insulin that you give yourself, which raises your insulin, obviously, because it is insulin. Let's check some lab work. Do you say, do you have any skin tags? Yeah, I'll, I'll look for any number of, of clinical signs. You guys may know if you have a lot of skin tags, that's a sign of insulin resistance, yep. right? If you have something called acanthosis nigricans, which is a darkness of pigmentation under your arms or on your neck, that's, that's a sign of insulin resistance. If, you're, if, you're, if the widest part of you, if the part of you that's liable to bump the door frame is in the middle, <laughs> you've got some degree of insulin resistance. And so that person by definition needs an A1C and a C peptide to see where they're at. Otherwise, what am I doing to help that patient at all? What am I even doing? If I'm not checking those things on people with overt signs of insulin resistance that I can see across the room, like across the other side of the cruise ship, I'm like, yeah, he's insulin resistant. <laughs> I wonder what his A1C is, right? Why would, if, I'm, if you're in my office and you're paying me a copay and I'm not gonna check that, what am I doing? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So yeah, so there's different experts talk about this differently. Some say less than 10. And that's why I love the C-peptide because it's a, it's a much more definite cutoff. It doesn't matter if you're taking insulin or not. And then if, if your C-peptide is one-tenth of a point above the, the reference range of normal, you're insulin resistant and you're pre-diabetic, the end, okay? And, and you think, well, God, I don't wanna be that. I don't wanna know that. No, you do. You do wanna know that because just like my friend here who used to have an A1C of 12, he fixed it, okay? And so when you were first diagnosed, did they send you to a, a dietitian, nutritionist? Not really. No, okay. So they really just half-assed you, didn't they? Yeah, okay. And so when you were diagnosed, did they did anybody get sent to a dietitian or a nutritionist? What'd they tell you to eat? You guys hear this? So we absolutely can't blame this on the patient because they were sent from one expert to another expert who told them without doubt and gave them pretty handouts and graphs and charts and said, here, you need to eat lots of carbs every day, lots of whole grains, lots of fruits, drink your orange juice, eat, now, and you can have pancakes, but make sure they're whole grain. 
pancakes because that's somehow magically better, right? So this doctor diagnosed you and then sent you to a, a, a specialist who made you worse. Uh huh. And then, the, then when they couldn't figure out why your stuff wouldn't go down, they sent you to an endocrinologist who then started you on the $500 a month measure. I see. And so everybody was getting paid and everybody was making good money, but who was helping you? Who, who wound up helping you? Where did you hear about keto? Rubber band theory. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. And so you learned it from your mom and a friend. Well, yeah. Yeah. Who else? Who else? Learned, like, got no help from nutritionists, dietitians, but got help from somebody on social media, a Facebook friend, or somebody who said, "Hey, have you heard of keto? Yeah, that's how you are." Um, yeah, I started. You met I got diagnosed only oh, yeah. two years ago. Now. Yeah, if it weren't for social media, the type 2 diabetes epidemic would bankrupt the U.S. government within the next 10 or 15 years. You guys are going to basically save the United States. That's what you're going to do, literally, financially, by saving yourself and by saving your mama or saving your cousin or saving your brother. That's literally what's going to happen out of this ketogenic movement. That's why I love it so much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. if you have type 2 diabetes you cannot trust the experts who should be the experts you go to to help you with type 2 diabetes you absolutely cannot trust them to help you with this and that's that's the inside out upside down twilight zone thing that I was bitching at Nisha about when she said why don't you make a YouTube video okay that's that's what it was it's like how what these four people they're just they're like here eat some more carbs here have some orange juice right it's fine yes ma'am uh, when i was diagnosed she was about 16 but they said it was pre-diabetic and then and then we're really didn't anything until she So you guys got to go away from this, taking with you the information that pre-diabetes, that's not a, oh, okay, that's a huge red flag. In, the, in my family growing up, we would call that the train whistle. And you, know what, you know what it means when the train whistle blows? Get off the track, right? That's what that means, right? And another good thing we learned in the South is don't ever stand behind the horse. <laughs> Nothing good ever comes from that, right? And so basically, these, these diabetic experts are telling you guys to get right behind the horse and ignore the train whistle. That's what they're telling you to do. And everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. We'll check it again in six months. Yes, ma'am. So I know we talked about this yesterday, but if, if artificial sweeteners are having an impact on your insulin, is that going to show up in your A1C? No, not okay. necessarily. No. But it will show up in a C peptide. Okay. Right? And so that's why you got to know how you react to the artificial sweeteners. 
because if you're if you are insulin resistant, pre-diabetic or type two diabetic, you don't even have have any form of sugar in your house. Period. It needs to be gone uh, if you value your life, and if you don't want your children to have to come visit you at the nursing home, because that's where this ultimately leads to. Type two diabetics don't die peacefully in their sleep. That's not how it works, okay? You suffer and you suffer, and then you get to share that suffering with your family, and then your poor grandkids have to go to the nursing home and see you when you've been sort of half cleaned up, and you see my, there's nothing pretty about type two diabetes. There's nothing romantic about it. It is a disaster that currently the American uh, Medical Association is ignoring. The American Diabetic Association is ignoring it, okay? They're trying to give you pretty, uh, you know, recipes on their website, colorful orange juice, whole grain pancakes. Oh, and yeah, you can have a slice or two of cantaloupe, it's fine. Yeah, no, you can't have any of that if you value your life and your health, okay? Because type two diabetes is a disease of too much blood sugar and a disease of too much insulin. And so either making you produce more insulin to lower your blood sugar, that doesn't fix anything, that doesn't lower the risk, okay? The only way to lower your risk and reverse your type 2 diabetes is to lower your blood sugar. And you do that by slashing your carbohydrate intake. Okay, that's how you do that. Yes, sir. Question about A1C. The lab test comes back with a normal range. Yes. On one test, it was even called an ideal range. Mm -hmm. I believe it's 4.8 to 5.6. Yes, that's right. Is there any such thing as too low? Like Great question. Great question. Has anybody, any of you guys who have fixed it, have you been told or spooked because your A1C was too low? Anybody heard that yet? Because you're going to, that'll be the next thing, Jimmy. Watch. This is oh, going to be the next happened. thing. And there's actually already a study that was done in the U.S. that was partially sponsored by Big Pharma Money. And guess what they found in their research? Is that the, is that, you remember the, bi, the bimodal curve? If your A1C is too high, that's definitely bad. It's going to shorten your lifespan. But they also found, oh, if it gets too low, oh, it looks like your, your all-cause mortality might go up because of that. But that study was partially funded by Big Pharma Motion, who makes the billions to keep your insulin high, okay? Now, there's another study that was done, I think, in the UK. Huge study. Tens of thousands of people. And they found a straight line. The lower your A1C, the longer you live, period. period. Huge study, okay? And they, they obviously, they weren't funded by Big Pharma. They do it differently over there, okay? And so I'm telling you, if your doctor says, ooh, your A1C is getting too low because if it's, if it's under 4.8, it's, it's flagged on the lab, right? And, the, and there are doctors out there who are going to start saying, well, that's probably not very good for you. And so basically what they're saying is, by you having a very low normal blood sugar, that's somehow bad for you. That's literally what they're saying. Think about that. What? They can tell you to go home and eat a spoon of sugar. Yeah, go eat some sugar. Your blood sugar is too low. Right. That's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, berberine's fine. I have no problem with it, but you just need to cut your carbs. And that's why I, I get very blunt about type 2 diabetes. You don't need to play any reindeer games with this. You need to slash your carbs, period. Yeah, it's, not yeah. it's a supplement. Yeah, it's a supplement that you can take. And that's, you, but there, you don't need a supplement to reverse, completely reverse your type 2 diabetes or your pre-diabetes or your insulin resistance. You just need to slash your carbs. The end. That's it. That's all you need to know. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, we haven't, we, there, there's a huge carnivore community, and I'm not advocating that carnivore diet. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm not, but I'm not advocating it for you. But there are people who have been eating zero carbohydrates for over a decade, and they're great. They look great, they feel great. I mean, look at Maria. Does she look deficient in anything to you? No, do I look deficient in anything? You see my point? Well, we were all taught that. Oh, you won't get enough vitamin C, you won't get enough this, you won't get enough that. But we've yet to see that in, pra in practice. And this is not just one guy out there doing who hasn't eaten any carbs. This is thousands and thousands of people. Are you a member of the World Carnivore Facebook group? I'm aware of it, yeah. How many members do they have now? 
30,000 people in that Facebook group who are either completely zero carb or they might have one gram here and there with some herbs and spices on their meat. Otherwise, for years and years and years, they've not eaten a single carb and they're fine, okay? But I want you to look into that, but I'm not advocating it, right? But I'm not saying cut them to zero. I'm just saying if, if you're eating 50, less than 50 grams total carbs a day and your A1C is still above 5.6, you need to cut them to 40. And you need to check it again in three months and then you need to cut them to 30. And you need to keep cutting them until your A1C is 5.5 or lower. Then you have, you've cured your type two diabetes or your prediabetes, you have stopped that damage from happening. You have saved your family from all the suffering that's coming. It's not a question of, of will it. It's a question of when and which, which way you gonna suffer. That's the question, okay? But by lowering the carbs enough, you can completely prevent that from happening. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a great doctor. Um, so I don't deal with this, but I know a lot of people do. They go in and say, I want my A1C checked. The doctor says, nope, don't need it. And it's a back and forth. They're afraid to say, I don't care, I want it. Yeah. Insurance won't pay for it. So what would you need to hear from a patient to make you go, they need to get their A1C checked? If they mentioned the word, they would have it checked. <laughs> If, if for me. You work, if you work you. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so first of all, let me say this. If any of you guys, now, some of the esoteric tests that Dr. Lomansky and I talk about may spook your doctor. They may be like, ooh, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I should, I don't know. But an A1C, if your doctor refuses to check an A1C on you and you're over 21 years of age, you're done. You need to fire that doctor immediately and tell every friend you know he's dangerous, don't go see him. I refuse to run my insulin anymore. And yeah, I had to fire. yeah, yeah. And now insulin is a little more esoteric. It's still very useful and, and needed. But an A1C, if your doctor refuses an A1C, I don't even know what planet he lives on or she lives on. That's stupid. Or insulin and any other test. Like yeah. the doctor might say, no, what, what, what does the doctor need to hear to order that test? Well, I, okay, so, if, and so first of all, A1C, they just ought to check that, okay. firstly. But secondly, if they're like, well, no, I mean, you know, you're not a diabetic, I'm not going to check that. You can say, well, I checked my blood sugar on my mom's and my blood sugar fasting was 120. What's that mean? And that, if that's not a clue for your doctor to check an A1C, you need a new doctor right then. Yes, sir. Uh, there's not an A1C test like at Walgreens. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like that. That's right. Think about I think they're way the heck better than not checking it at all. Uh, to my knowledge, they're as accurate as the ones you get checked in your, in your doctor's office. Even if they're off by two tenths of a point, that's still going to give you a ballpark, right? Because if it's a six or a 6.2, you're a pre-diabetic. It doesn't matter if it's six or 6.2 because you, that's it. You got it. You need to work on it immediately. So I would definitely check that if your doc won't order an A1C for you. Uh, also, uh, on the C peptide test, what is the normal range? It's different for different reference labs. And so whether it's LabCorp or Quest, it'll be a different number, or if they use a local hospital lab, it might even be a third different range. But all those ranges are set pretty realistically. And so if you're, and so you just look at your C-peptide result, if it's one-tenth of a point high, not a point, but one-tenth of a point high, you are pre-diabetic, you are insulin resistant, you need to get busy with the ketogenic way of eating, ASAP, period, the end. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier about a doctor basically steering you wrong or in the path that is going to be harmful to you. I'm fortunate my doctor's not like that, and but my wife's very educated on which way I should go. Good. But what Lucky if you man. walked in there, you know, blind that you're just doing what the doctor doctor told you, and you leave the recommended uh, mm -hmm. diet that he or she puts in front of you, which yeah. is going to be harmful, but I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Uh, what can you do to steer that person in a, in a better direction? You mean educate your doctor or educate that person? Okay. Like if that's a friend of yours, you mean? Well, no, I'm just saying in general. I mean, if I get steered somewhere wrong, I'm not going to use that doctor again for, one, for a starter. Right. Uh, but I'm just at, asking for the people who are going in the wrong direction, you know, giving them a, an option to fix it, you know, by either getting another doc. By, uh, yeah, get another doc and, and get active. And that's why I'm sending every one of you guys out of here as keto warriors and keto spreaders and keto vangelists. I don't know if that's copyrighted, but you guys gotta, nobody else, is gonna, nobody else is gonna help these people. Nobody else is gonna help your friend who's got a 7.9 A1C right now, and he don't even know it because his doctor didn't check it. 
Y'all got to y'all got to help the, help me to help those people because otherwise they will not know. Yes, ma'am. Um, my doctor, I just went to a new one, and I won't even consider twice. And she was semi okay, but she But the damage may already been done. Really? But keto didn't do that damage. No, I don't. Protein didn't do that damage. That. And this is another huge myth, and I'll, I'll shut up after this. This is important. If your doctor says to you, oh, you're eating too much protein, it's going to damage your kidneys, you need a new doctor. That is an absolute myth. There's no truth to that whatsoever. Uh, Dr. Fung, who's a kidney specialist, talks about this at length. That's if you have if you have normal kidneys or have stage one or stage two or stage three chronic kidney disease, protein is not a problem. You can eat your protein. You can eat your meat. Okay, that is not what harmed your kidneys. That's not why you have microalbuminuria. That's because of the years of the, the high A1C and the damage you did with all the carbs before you knew better. That's what caused that. I believe in in stage one and two and maybe stage three chronic kidney disease. You can reverse some of that with keto and intermittent fasting. Dr. Fung thinks you probably got it, it's probably permanent. But, wouldn't you rather just stop it right where it's at? Right, instead of letting it progress by following the American Diabetic Association's diet? Yeah, yes ma'am. Mostly fat. fat. Yeah, moderate protein. Okay, so is that what makes the difference that you're incorporating more fat? Yeah. Not yes, protein. to a certain degree. And now, Dr. Ben Bickman has a great video about this. When you're eating very, very low carb, the protein in your diet doesn't really cause all the gluconeogenesis that, that it can sometimes. If you're eating a high carb diet, Oh yeah, protein will jack your insulin. There's no doubt it'll make you make more blood sugar. There's no doubt about that. But if you're eating super low carb, the protein's just not going to do that. And like the great example is people on a carnivore diet, their right. blood sugar is stellar. Like they have A1Cs of 4.6, 4.5, because they and so your your liver is going to make glucose, but that's fine because some cells in your body, like your red blood cells, need that. Your liver's got that. It does not need your help with the whole wheat pancakes. It doesn't need you to do that. It can make that glucose if it needs it. If it doesn't need it, it won't make it, right? And so gluconeogenesis is not your enemy. Insulin's not your enemy, right? Even blood sugar's not your enemy. The enemy is too many carbohydrates that you put in your face. That's your enemy. That's what's gonna cause, hurt your kidneys and cause you to be spilling out albumin in your urine that's what's going to cause all the complications of type 2 diabetes, okay? That's the bad news. The good news is, is you guys can walk out of here today as keto warriors and say, oh, hell no, that's not going to happen to my mama. That's not going to happen to my brother. That's not going to happen to my son. Not going to, that's not going to happen. I'm about to happen to them, and I'm about to educate them, and that's just not going to happen. And you can literally change their life, change your life, and guess what you just change when you change your life and their life? You just changed the world, didn't you? That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. All right, guys. Jimmy's going to slap me. Thank you. Dr. Ken Perry. Uh, by the way, you asked the question about the test a while ago and what if my doctor doesn't run. So that website I gave you guys yesterday, the private MD labs.com, any lab test now.com, 
you can ask for fasting.